My name is Tamara James, and uh, I will be your speaker today. I am a tech evangelist and founder of Technical LA, um, and I'm really, really excited to uh, speak to you about the Swift programming language uh, because this is something that is definitely on the rise. Um, and Swift is a, a language that has soared uh, beyond its youth um, and really has kind of taken over um, and, and spread out into a lot of different things. So I'm here to demystify uh, the Swift programming language for you and help you decide whether, um, help you kind of decide whether, uh, excuse me, I'm giving a talk, I'm giving a talk. Yes, I'm giving a talk. Sorry, virtual. <laughs> um, yes, and help you kind of decide uh, whether Swift, the Swift languages is right for you, okay? So um, let's go ahead and jump right in. So 2014, Swift was born. Uh, Swift, it was it was definitely all the rage when it first came out, if you can remember. Um, and this is why I like to say, oh, Swift is kind of like Beyonce. It was just like, it kind of just soared, right? Um, it, in, in popularity, everyone, when it came out, everyone kind of flocked to it. Um, and there were so many reasons why. Uh, for one, it was really, really appealing to uh, beginners, right? Uh, people who were, uh, just coming into programming and then people who were also just jumping into Swift from the Objective-C side. And for those of you who are not familiar with Objective-C, Objective-C is basically Swift's, uh, excuse me, Swift's, um, yeah, Swift's, what do you call it, predecessor? I think I'm saying it right. You know what I mean? It's, it, it was the language that came before, right? Uh, and Objective-C was the language, uh, the sole language that uh, Apple had created for developers to build, um, you know, Apple products and um, Apple-based uh, applications for the Apple platform. Objective-C was the um, sole language for about, a good three decades straight. So here comes Swift. Um, and then immediately you start to see these differences in simplicity, right? The main thing was the simplicity. Um, and so as you can see, like something as simple as initializing something, right? Um, you have these adderists and you have these extra like brackets and then you have to, um, you know, you have to intentionally, excuse me, intentionally like allocate um, you know, your, your, your memory, uh, like you, you have to do all of these things when you're initializing as opposed to in Swift, you can do this, you, Swift kind of does this all for you, right? And it's very, very uh, simplified. Another thing was, um, again, more into the catchy syntax. Um, and not just for people coming from the Apple realm, right, who are already familiar with Objective-C, it was catchy for um, most programmers. So people coming from the JavaScript side, people coming from Python, people coming from C++, um, and, you know, even down to like the, the var keywords, and there are a lot of different similarities when it comes to um, these languages. So people who are coming from these languages, they were... Um, really, really interested, you know, and they were they were really intrigued to kind of see what what all this swift hype and rage was about, right? Because if you can remember, all the publications were talking about it, um, all the developer communities, the blogs, everybody was talking about this new found language, right? But there was only for uh, it was only set for mobile development or a development on the Apple platform. So the fact that all these other developers were kind of side eyeing it, like, oh. Okay, um, it kind of made it attractive to try it out, right? Um, even if it meant, you know, you you are, you know, a front end developer and you want to probably tap into uh, iOS development or Mac OS development, right? Um, so the syntax was very much easier to read because it was uh, catchy. Um, 
and it's really important for a new language. Um, there are no semicolons, as we said before, you know, excess square brackets, addresses for pointers, so on and so forth. This is a big one, interoperability. Um, and this is, this is something that uh, really was a game changer when it came to the Swift programming language. Um, and what does this mean? This means that, for example, like, in, like here, you have a uh, Python library. You can simply import any Python library in Swift and it just works, it compiles. So, and similarly, you can do, um, you can import uh, C and C++ libraries into Swift as well. So yes, yeah, so if you need, you know, specific functionality, um, but it's not implemented in Swift, um, you can, you know, import corresponding like Python or C++ um, or like a C package. Um, and you can import um, modules from Swift, uh, and call Python functions and convert values between, um, you know, between those two languages, whether it's uh, Swift and Python or Swift and C++, so on and so forth. Another thing is, uh, it's a really, really safe language. Uh, and what is what does this mean? We'll get into the, the details just after this, but. It's very, very safe um, in a sense, to the sense where it's very memory, um, very, very, very uh, memory centered around memory, right? Um, and it's something that really defines Swift as a language. Uh, so it prevents huge memory leaks, which then of course contributes to the fact that it performs so fast. Um, as a language, which again is something that pulled people to it, like, okay, this compiler is really, really powerful. Um, and yeah, and that's because of how uh, memory driven uh, uh, and, and really hyper aware it is about uh, memory allocation um, and preventing those memory leaks um, that Swift really is. A lot of that is due to uh, optionals. Um, now optionals, like anybody who has taken a peek at the Swift language, you notice this, right? Um, so me coming from uh, Objective-C, you know, an Objective-C background, this is something that threw me off a little bit, right? So we're like, oh, extra, punct extra punctuation and code, like, okay. Um, now I have to deal with question marks and exclamation, like, well, what does this even mean, right? Um, and basically, optionals check for and protect values when they're, when they're compiling, okay? Um, so what does this mean, okay? So for example, let's say you're, you're building um, an Instagram, kind of Instagram clone, right? You have a username, you have followers, um, let's say, you know, you have a user who, um, if, if they have the application nine times out of 10, they, they have uh, a username, right? So, you know, that value is always going to be there. They may not have any followers. Okay. There are some accounts on there. Um, you know, for those of us who have, um, you know, stalker accounts are just like, okay, I, <laughs> you're hiding behind the accounts, right? Um, we have those follower, those, those that follower number that is not guaranteed, right? That is something that we we we're not going to know the number, and and it could end up being nil, right? Um, so that is something that value for followers. That question mark, think of it as like a force field, right? It's protecting that value. Um, so anything that's called wrapping, okay? So when you're you, you wrap, think of it like you have this question mark, the question mark is having the, creating that force field and kind of wrapping that value to say, hey, this may or may not be, uh, this value may, may or not be uh, nil. Um, if it is nil, we don't want our application to crash. We don't want our function to break down and, you know, we don't want, um, you know, anything to go wrong. So we protect this value. We don't want this to be the cause of something else, right? Um, a username. So you see the exclamation point, and that is what you call implicitly unwrapping. 
um, you're unwrapping this value. So you're kind of leaving it open. You don't have that question mark where it has a force field. You're leaving it open. Um, so that is the exclamation point where you're unwrapping this value and you're saying, hey, um, I, and you want to do this Swift is very, very like it will complain to you um, <laughs> if it feels like this is something that needs to be wrapped or this is something that needs to be unwrapped. So, you know, there's Swift is very, very aware and a hyper aware language when it comes to, again, that memory factor, right? So unwrapping uh, that value means that you trust that this is not going to be nil. Okay, so it does not need any protection. Okay, so th those are those are optionals. Something that you you definitely would uh, see and something that might throw you off at first sight. So moving on into evolution, something happened in 2015. Swift became open sourced. Yes, yeah, Swift became open sourced, and this was a really big deal. Um, you know. All of a sudden, there was this community of uh, developers who kind of rallied around this language. And for the first time, this was something that um, Apple was sort of giving to the developer community to say, hey, we are letting you in. This is our most prized uh, you know, baby. This is our new language, right? And we're giving you some input. We're giving you a voice. Um, and we're giving you power to be able to, um, you know, build community around it and, and make it the language that you want, um, make it the language that you need. Um, so that was the first time that uh, Apple had given the developer community that sort of uh, power. And it was amazing. To date, um, Swift has over 800 contributors. Um, over 100,000 commits, um, over 1,600 releases to date, um, over 8,000 forks, and around 500 pull requests. Okay, so that, that speaks a lot to, if you think about the releases and the commits and all, it speaks a lot, a lot to how active the community is, right? We say Swift what became open source in 2015, it's 2020. You know, we're getting updates every six months, sometimes it's every four months um, where we're getting a new version of Swift where it's now more direct, it's more simple. Like, oh, okay, um, I was able to kind of infer what this meant in Swift. Now this is more direct. It's even more direct, even more simplified, um, even more legible as a language, right? And even more um, optimized, you know, the, the compiler itself. So um, this is all due to the collective effort between Apple and the developer community, and it, this speaks to a lot of the, a lot of the work that has gone into building uh, this awesome, uh, powerful language. And like I said, it's it's is it was this new thing, right? It was one thing for it to be open source, you know, and it was great for the community, but there was still this kind of like issue where. You know, for one, it was, Swift was still for mobile, right? Um, or for iOS, um, it was still used for the Apple platform. So a lot of, because Apple is so niched, right? Um, you, know, you know, basically there's this King Apple theory that I always talk about. Um, and basically that means that you must build um, with Apple products for Apple products, um, building Apple products uh, with an Apple language, right? So there's this whole kind of like ecosystem, very niched ecosystem that um, ultimately a lot of developers don't want to, outside of you know people who were in that realm, a lot of newcomers, they don't want to enter that because they don't want to feel boxed in, right? And also, Apple just had this history of not having as much transparency when it comes to just the community. So the fact that this is all new um, and a lot of developers felt like they would be boxed in um, by choosing to uh, utilize Swift as a language, um, it, was a, it, it wasn't all that um, easy to, to make a transition. So, and for some, it was just outright a turnoff.
But then something else happened. Later in 2015, server-side Swift was introduced, okay? Yes, Swift on the server, okay? So what did this mean? Okay, now we're crossing over into, uh, you know, Swift now transcending beyond just Apple um, and into this serverless realm, right? Um, and what did all, what did this mean as well? Like multiple IDEs now, um, like I said, you had to build with the Apple language, you know, on Apple products, right, for Apple products. Um, and before you could not use Swift outside of Xcode. Um, and now with this new found, you know, uh, um, variety and this, these capabilities, now you're able to use it, use them in other environments. So Xcode, Xcode of course, Sublime, Atom, Code Runner, VS Code, you name it. Um, there, there's Swift support for every single um, one of those IDEs. So now, again, it starts to, people outside of the mobile community are like, okay, still a little skeptical. But they're like, oh, wow, Swift on the server. What is that? What is that like? Hmm. And so, and then that adds this other, this other benefit, right? As a developer, adding end-to-end -end capabilities. What does that mean? That means that now if I wanted to build my backend uh, using Swift. And of course, I would build my front end natively. Um, you know, if I was a mobile, so if I, let's say I'm a mobile developer and I'm building my front end natively with Swift, I can build my back end natively with Swift. Kind of makes me a full stack developer, right? Purely with Swift. So adding these end to end capabilities for people to uh, build out their applications entirely and solely just using Swift. So this was, this is a huge, huge deal. Some of the, um, these are some of, you know, some of the server-side Swift frameworks. Um, some of you may have heard of Vapor. Vapor is the top, um, the top uh, server-side Swift framework. And I say it's the top, not just because it's like, well, my favorite, um, but just in terms of the, um, the bandwidth of the community, um, the support, um, the amount of documentation, and just its popularity. It's, it's known for its speed. And uh, so it, it, from the community standpoint, uh, Vapor is the top um, server-side Swift framework. And then we have perfect.org, which was the very first server-side Swift framework um, that was utilized um, that was created, and that was in later on after uh, Swift became open source um, later on in 2015. Uh, then you have Katora. Katora was IBM's server side Swift framework. Um, and it, the thing about Katora is it, it, it was very much a high contender, a very close second to Vapor in terms of community, in terms of uh, stability. Uh, but it was sadly sunsetted, I believe, earlier this year. And I think they're trying to figure out something else to do um, as far as repurposing it instead of just like deprecating it altogether. But as far as IBM goes and Katora right now, it is pretty much sunsetted. Um, and then Swift Engine. Swift Engine is this like independent kind of um, framework. And basically it's like the first turnkey, like serverless Swift platform for app development. Um, and I'd like to bring it up because uh, some friends of mine actually created this um, and they're instructors over at uh, USC. So basically, you know, Swift on the server is truly on the rise and is also now being supported in conjunction with platforms like um, AWS Lambda, Apache uh, OpenWhisk, um, and Google Cloud. So you've probably seen a glimpse of Swift here and there, and you're just like, why, how? Um, yes, it, it, it is growing in terms of uh, that presence and support on these different platforms, even in containerization, right? So we're, we're moving into DevOps now, right? You can now build containerized applications on platforms like AWS. Um, 
OpenStack. OpenStack has um, an architecture called uh, SwiftStack. So you can run Swift servers on OpenStack. So yes, this was a big deal. This kind of caused a wave um, of just that running into different realms when it came to Swift. Now, why are all of these uh, different frameworks being created? Like, you know, what's the point of using Swift as a backend? Like, why would I even do that? I have Node, I have all of these different, you know, um, all the typical and more popularly widely uh, used uh, languages and frameworks, okay? Why would I use Swift? And a large part of that goes is attributed to performance. We talked about that. We talked about how it's a very safe and, and, and very fast language. And that's where the popularity kind of like hit home for a lot of people. But I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, okay, like, is it really that fast? Is it really good? Well, let's try it out. I'm going to go to this link right now. And we're going to test it out for ourselves. How about that? Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute. Okay, and we are going to head to this site. Okay, which is Benchmarks Game. Okay. And what we're going to do is let me uh, go ahead and reshare this. Okay, so this is the computer language benchmarks game, okay? And you can literally just basically test out uh, performance and, and uh, run these different languages against each other, okay? Um, so you can, there's like a different uh, uh, algorithms here and you can test these uh, languages against each other um, uh, with these uh, algorithms to run these algorithms. So let's just go ahead. I'm going to click on Swift. Okay. And it's going to test Swift against these different ones right now. So versus C versus C++ versus Go versus Java and versus Rust. Okay. So um, it started us off Swift versus Java. Okay. And here we have our first algorithm. This is the name for our first algorithm. Yes, this is a real real program here. Okay, oh, this is like the listing out here. Okay, it's a real program here, okay. And what we have is Swift versus Java, okay. Uh, you see we've run this program and Swift has compiled in 1.87 seconds compared to Java, 4.15 seconds, okay. You can see the, the memory usage here. Um, that's just, I mean, 39,000 compared to 79,000. Okay, we can see the CPU uh, loadage, right? Um, and again, it, it goes down with these different uh, algorithms. Uh, and so we have this, this new algorithm called nBody. And again, it beats Java 4.89 seconds compared to Java um, 6.76 seconds, okay? Um, and it goes on and on and on and on, right? These different ones, okay? So Java, let's try Go. Go is one of my favorite languages as well, okay? Same algorithms, okay? Uh, 1.87 seconds as it was before with this algorithm and then Go 3.75 seconds to compile, okay? And you can pretty much, it, it's pretty much faster than a lot of these different languages. Let's try C++. Okay, just just faster in this in this algorithm right here. Just like there's some milliseconds there um, where Swift beats C plus plus, right? And it's kind of neck and neck here, and you can even see it, you know, kind of where uh, uh, C plus plus kind of gets Swift in the end. But all in all, Swift is widely known for being super fast, super performant. Um, 
and when it comes to uh, compiling. So again, when we think about what's important to us, um, that is an important factor as a developer. Okay, so let us go back to sharing our screen here. Okay, cool. So these are the basically the reasons, you know, Swift has been a top 10 language to learn almost since its birth. Okay. Let's say, you know, it, it was born, it was born in 2014. Let's say at least since 2015 that I've seen, that I've personally seen on the basically the top uh, tech publications out there. Swift has been a top 10 language consistently every year to learn. Um, since it's become open source, you know, running right into uh, being used on the server um, where you're building web applications, people are even building websites with Swift. Um, you know, you're building, you know, you're creating endpoints, a backend um, and, and becoming full stack, you know, we've got Swift developers now becoming full stack developers using running purely Swift. Um, it's a huge, huge deal. And there's a lot of potential and it's growing so much to the point where it, the demand for Swift experience is just continuing to rise, continuing, continue to rise. So at this point, it might seem like I'm selling the language to you. Oh, Swift is so great. Yes. Look how fast it is. Look how clean it is. Look how this, look at that. So it might sound like I'm kind of selling it to you. Like, okay. All right, you know, even though it's good, these are all facts, this is all true, you know, you're like, okay, uh, but do I want to use Swift? Is this something that I really want to do? You know, and it all comes down to this question, what are your priorities as a developer, right? So is Swift appropriate for the applications or the project that you're working on right now, right? Or want to work on? Could Swift be a better, uh, and more feasible medium for you to work with. Um, these are things that I'm just trying to expose you to, to when you're considering these things. Um, I was responding to a tweet actually yesterday, um, a huge education platform uh, took down their Swift content and they were like, hey, we wanna take it down because we want something that is cross plat. We want to offer content on cross platform um, frameworks and languages and that was understandable, but it, it spoke to a, a lot. It spoke a lot to how much people don't know about the language. Um, they were saying that uh, Swift is just for iOS and we don't want to, um, we don't want to cater to just iOS development. And that's fine, but it speaks a lot to how much people really don't know about the capabilities um, of the Swift language because it's way, way beyond uh, just iOS development and just that Apple uh, kind of stratosphere. So let's get into the future of Swift. We talked about how easy it is to read um, with all the great work that the open source community has been doing and all the great improvements and all the very Swift, no pun intended, improvements that have been ha happening every couple of months. Um, you know, it's become easier to read, right? Um, less of an inference and more of a very direct, um, you know, syntax, right? Uh, the, the, the open source community has been growing immensely, like continuing to grow. Um, and that just speaks volumes to how much people are actually going to learn uh, Swift development and, and people are really, really picking up and trying it in their different respective uh, realms, right? Um, we can also expect for it to be um, more performant and type safe um, as it has been, um, but just growing and enhancing in those spaces as well. Um, server side, I believe there are gonna be a lot more improvements when it comes to uh, the uh, for, for server-side SWIFT. Again, people are building web apps. A lot of people don't know that they can build 
um, uh, web apps, you know? So people are using it, but not as much as they, they, they could because people are still kind of on the, they're, they're, they're on the cusp when it comes to it, right? Um, they may have tried it out once and they're just like, okay, do, is this something that I'm ready to take to production? Absolutely, Swift is, even if in its youth, six years, um, you know, Swift is absolutely stable enough um, and absolutely supported enough for you to continue and to try things out and to, you know, push things into production and really have something that is of value. I expect to see um, more usage when it comes to microservices and containerization, as I've seen, you know, people like AWS and OpenStack, it's a big deal for them to make those kinds of decisions to support that, right? Um, and so I can only see more growth and more coverage in terms of like Swift presence and support um, when it comes to uh, those two things, microservices and containerization as well. So next I'm gonna get into some trends um, and developments with Swift that you will definitely see on the rise in the future. Okay. First and foremost, Swift UI. Swift UI. Um, I get really excited when I think about Swift UI. Uh, Swift UI is about a year old itself. You've probably seen uh, developers on Twitter and different form forums uh, speaking of Swift UI. And you're like, what is this Swift UI everyone keeps talking about? But basically, Swift UI is a you know, a new uh, declarative framework um, that was released with iOS 13. Um, and it was used to create user interfaces for Swift. So for people who are coming from Objective-C, this is um, almost equivalent to UI kit, but this is something a little bit different. It's actually a lot faster and it's actually something that is even more declarative uh, when it comes to building out these beautiful and reactive um, interfaces. Um, and just so you all are aware, Swift is uh, geared more towards the Apple platform. So you can only utilize this to um, this framework to build for iOS, watchOS, and or macOS, but it makes it easier to basically port your applications on all three platforms at once. Swift for Windows. Bet you didn't know this was coming up. Um, Swift maintainers have been hard at work on this for at least the past year or so. Um, and it, yes, it's finally it's finally here. Um, basically, you know, with these core libraries, uh, with Swift's core libraries, um, and you know, the flexible, you know, we call we we talked about interoperability. Um, you know, with Swift, um, of Swift with C, uh, it's now possible to develop um, applications on Windows purely in Swift, okay? So, you know, you can take advantage of the existing kind of like, you know, uh, core libraries on the, the, the uh, Windows platform um, utilizing Swift. So yes, you can build applications, um, Swift applications on Windows. Yes, and they do, so if you go to uh, swift.org, you can utilize, um, you know, all of that documentation to learn how to install Swift on your uh, Windows machine and basically get started. They even have an example application for you to get started with if that's something you wanted to try. Um, we do have some early adopters already kind of up and running, um, but yes, this is live, this is real. So uh, yeah, if you want to try it out, you can go over to uh, swift.org. P.S. Uh, you can also install Swift on Linux as well. I get a lot of questions about that. And yes, you can install Swift on Linux as well. So again, if you want to learn more, um, head over to the swift.org site to learn more. How relevant is... Oh, hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, how relevant is Swift in the industry? 
How relevant is SWIFT? Again, you want you, you want to know if, if you if you're thinking of okay, it's coming from Apple still. There's a little bit of skepticism. You know, I see that it's growing in these different spaces. Like, how relevant is this going to be? And like, you know, right now, in the next year, in the next five years, in the next ten years, like, Swift has rightfully earned you know a place in just about every realm, as we can see. You know, as we kind of talked about and have kind of you know um, dove into. You know, Swift has slowly but surely, if you can call it slowly, in six years, right? Um, earned its place of support and presence in just almost every realm. Um, so as you can see, like the importance of having like a powerful compiler along with like the simple and direct syntax, um, that, that legibility, right? It goes a long way for developers and, you know, our entire workflow, you know, and our decision-making um, so it goes a long way and it goes well beyond, like I said, that Apple stratosphere. So much so that, you know, people in, uh, in the machine learning realm have started to adopt it. Yes. So uh, yes, you've probably seen, or maybe you haven't seen, this may be your first time seeing or hearing the fact that Swift is being utilized um, within machine learning and data science. So, um, you know, since Python, Python of course being probably the more widely used primary language when it comes to uh, machine learning, Python is notorious for being slow. Um, it's opened up the opportunity for, you know, other programming languages to sort of like tap in um, you know, to the data science landscape. So Swift in general is about eight times faster than Python. Um, and the types aren't checked in Python. So the program might like encounter like a, a type error at runtime and it may crash. And then, you know, when you're using Swift, the possibility of that happening is less, is less likely because Swift is statically typed, right? So um, it's very powerful when it comes to machine learning. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with TensorFlow, it's an open source library created by Google, uh, built to help you develop and maintain, um, excuse me, develop and train uh, machine learning models. So everything from object detection to uh, image classification, um, you know, TensorFlow has been that, um, an awesome, awesome uh, tool. And of course, like Swift, a language like Swift for TensorFlow is highly reliant upon Swift's um, operability with uh, Python. So uh, yeah, and basically Chris Latner, the, um, he, he's a former engineer uh, at Apple who ultimately created Swift. He was like the primary creator uh, of the Swift language over at Apple, um, he went over to Google to help them out and to kind of push the, uh, the, 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 the influence and the presence and support uh, when it comes to uh, TensorFlow being utilized with Swift. Um, and yeah, this is something that they're working on. Uh, they have some things that are um, in the works um, very much not production ready. Uh, if you go on the TensorFlow site, they will let you know that Swift for TensorFlow is technically still in beta, but it is something that, again, con you're considering the fact that Swift is so young and someone as big as Google or as big as, you know, uh, you know the, the, the team that's where the Google brain team is working on this and hard at work and really considering Swift when it comes to uh, machine learning. So I thought that was very powerful, very powerful. So who is it relevant for? The answer is we're all in this together, as you can see, <laughs> whether you're an iOS developer, backend developer, DevOps engineers, front-end developers, data scientists, junior devs, senior devs, mid-level devs, 
whatever, you know, we have, again, SWIFT has transcended the, the stratosphere of just Apple. And now all of us are able to be in this room and talk about how important SWIFT is in our different aspects, in our different fields um, as a programming language, right? Um, and we're able to talk to each other, help each other, um, even work more um, together in conjunction with each other when it comes to uh, building our applications with Swift. So we're, we're all in this together. And it goes back to what are your priorities as a developer? Is it right for you? Um, and those are things that considering what's out there for Swift, considering um, all those different features that we talked about of the Swift language, uh, the different uh, areas of support, um, think about the things that you're working on or that you want to work on, whether you're an enterprise or you're just an uh, indie developer. Is Swift something that you're interested in? You know, you're interested in trying, you're interested in maybe, you know, an alternative to the language that you're uh, utilizing, whether you're building a web app, building, you know, a back end um, with, you know, your front end in one language, Swift for a back end. Like, is this something that I want to do? Why would I want to do that? Right? And it all comes down to what your priorities are as a developer. Uh, so to learn more and get started, I would say uh, the swift.org site uh, that I mentioned, uh, definitely go on there. That's where you, know, you can find the sort of forum for the open source community and all the different developments uh, you know, along the Swift journey. Uh, of course, the Apple documentation, um, raywinderlich.com has very, very um, just updated content, constant content on uh, Swift development. Hacking with Swift, of course, uh, which is led by Paul Hudson, um, has a lot of great, great resources. Um, O'Reilly, uh, I've been giving a lot of um, trainings. I'm a recent instructor and author on the O'Reilly uh, learning platform. And, uh, you know, we are growing in terms of the, the uh, presence and the support that we have for learning and getting started with Swift. And of course you can follow me on Twitter at Tamara J and <laughs> to uh, learn more about the Swift language as well. And again, it's safe to say that uh, Swift will be a top 10 language. Uh, in 2021 and beyond. It's too important, it's too, um, you know, it's adopted in all these different areas, not because they're just like, oh, is this new thing? No, all of these different companies, all of these different uh, arenas, they see the potential in Swift. All these different companies who are now in demand for people with Swift experience, there is a demand there for a reason. And so my prediction, is of course Swift is a top 10, will be a top 10 language for 2021 and well beyond. And that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much. You can follow me on Twitter um, at Tamira J. Um, follow me on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv backslash Tamira J. Um, and I stream there every Thursday and the slides will be available um, at that link on the slide on GitHub. Uh, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Tamara, so much. Um, we have time for one question. Okay, one question. Uh, I see one question in the Q and A. We have one question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it says, are there any Swift alternatives to front-end frameworks like Angular, Vue, React? Swift alternatives to front end frameworks. Hmm. Uh, I think at the at the moment, um, you know, at the moment you have uh, Swift UI, which 
again, we talked about it being a declarative framework um, for building out your front ends. Um, Swift UI is probably the best bet and it's so easy to get started with Swift UI. There's a lot of content um, that is, I mean, even in just, it's only been out for a year, um, but that framework is probably the most powerful, um, the most effective and um, it's constantly just gaining that, that presence and support from the community. So you can see a lot more content on how to learn and how to get started um, with Swift UI. Um, yeah. Do we have time for one more? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Unrelated to code. I love your hair. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let me see. Um, I'm going to the Q&A. Oh, you mean, oh, sorry to clarify. I mean, web frameworks. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, but again, if you look into the server side, uh, Swift frameworks, you can basically build web, web applications um, using uh, some of those frameworks. One of them being Vapor. Vapor specifically has a, um, uh, basically a, a a capability of uh, templating. It has this like templating component called leaf and you can utilize HTML and um, JavaScript as well um, in conjunction with Swift uh, in order to build web applications. So yeah, I would try a uh, vapor, which is a um, server side Swift framework. Um, yeah, try out vapor and just see, see how it goes. They have a lot of documentation as well. So um, yeah, and you can always um, hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions about that and just getting started.